Let's dive into the message for today. We are beginning our small group semester. So if you look at your notes today, uh, there is a small group discussion guide now available. One of the things we've wanted to do moving forward as a church is we want to help people go deeper in their faith. And one of the ways we do that is, I don't know about you, I don't have the capacity to learn two or three spiritual truths a week and have the ability to work them into my life. One at best. And so what we want to create is the opportunity for you to take a spiritual truth on Sunday and figure out how do we walk this out? How do we work it into our life? How do we apply it to the different aspects of who we are? And what makes it beautiful for a lot of the men, I don't know, men, if if you're kind of like me, I'm not going to do homework for a small group. I've got enough going on in my life. I don't have time to do homework. Well, this eliminates any homework because the only homework is that you hear the message on Sunday and then you have some thoughts about it, which we all naturally do. People love to, to talk about what they hear and then go to a group and just discuss, how do I actually make this work in my life? And so that is available for you. I encourage you to follow along, begin to look at the questions and begin to think through how today's message impacts and applies to your life. Now, the reason we're doing this series, and I do not want you to miss it today, this could be the most critical message of your life if you understand what I'm teaching. And I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to, and I don't say this lightly that, because that, I know every week is my favorite message I've ever preached, and that is true, by the way. It is the favorite message I've ever preached that week. Um, this message, though, is one of the most critically important messages I can teach. I haven't done this in a number of years, and God has given me fresh revelation on it that I want to share with you today. And let me show you why this is so important. First John chapter 5, verse 4. This is the reason we're doing this series. And you're going to need this at some point in your future, if not right now. Here's what John says. For whatever is born of God, meaning if you're born again, If you've made a decision to follow Jesus, you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been born of God. Now, if you're not a believer today, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm really glad you're here because this is one of the best messages you could hear if you're not a Christian to understand what this life is all about and what is available to you in Christ. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. I don't know if you've noticed in your life or not, but the world is trying to overcome you. The world is trying to destroy you emotionally, trying to kill your marriage, trying to kill your family, going after your children, your health, your finances. The world is trying to overcome you. We as believers want to be in a place where we overcome Overcome the world. The world doesn't overcome us. We overcome the world. We overcome every attack, every trial, every giant, every adversity that ever comes our way. You see, Satan's job is to steal, to kill, and destroy. And the world is trying to steal, kill, and destroy. It's coming against you. But you in Christ have an ability to overcome the world. And then he says, this is the victory. This right here, what I'm about to tell you is the victory that has overcome the world. You need victory in your life. The title of today's message is, this is the victory. You need to know what this is. If you are going to overcome the world, if you are going to overcome all of the attacks that are coming against your family and your children and your marriage and your health and your finances, you need to know what this is because this is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. Our faith. Now, how many of you are believing God for something in your life right now? How many have an area of your life you need to overcome right now? This is the victory. Our faith. And so the number one point for today, and not just today, but the number one point for this entire series, for the rest of your life, is for you to critically understand, number one, faith is 
our victory. Faith. Faith is our victory. Faith is the victory that allows you to overcome the world. So here's what I want to say today. It is critically important for you then to know what faith is. If faith is the victory, if faith is what allows you to overcome every attack that comes against you, if faith is the victory that allows you to overcome what the world is trying to do to you, you need to understand what faith is. And I think we've heard that word so often in Christendom that we really don't know what it means. We say it so flippantly, we say it so loosely, we say it so often that many people have never stopped to really ask themselves, what is faith? What is faith? Faith is not trust. Trust is critically important, but it does not say trust is our victory. It says faith is our victory. We do not live by trust. We live by faith. We say things like this in the world. All you need is love. Love is important. Love, the Bible says, is the greatest, but it does not say love is the victory that overcomes the world. Love is the greatest force on earth, but love is not the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So as believers, we need to understand what faith is. And that's what we want to do over the next four weeks is we want to teach you how to walk by faith. It's what 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says. We, believers, followers of Jesus Christ, we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, the word walk there means manner of life, the way you live your life, the way you go about your daily life, the way you operate, the way you think, your grid, your filter. That's your walk. That is the manner of life. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, our manner of life is faith, not sight. Now, what I need you to remember to understand this is when you got saved, when you were born again, when you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us in Colossians 1, not in your notes, it says, he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us. So our citizenship was transferred into the kingdom of his dear son or the kingdom of light. Meaning there is a point in your life where you lived under the kingdom of darkness. You, you, you're, you were a citizen of the kingdom of darkness. And then you got saved. You were born again. And Jesus transferred your citizenship. You are no longer under the kingdom of darkness, but you are now under the kingdom of light or the kingdom of God's son. And this is what Jesus constantly was teaching us. How many times did he say the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like? throughout all of the parables, trying to teach us that living under the kingdom is very different than living under the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. To live under a new kingdom, you've got to understand the law of the land. Because every kingdom has different laws, different rules, different requirements. And so what he's saying is we have to relearn how we live, how we walk, the manner of our life. Because for years we lived under the kingdom of darkness, and the kingdom of darkness lives under the law of sight. That's the way we live. That's what we knew. That's what we operated in. We even have a phrase in America, seeing is, that's the kingdom of darkness. I'm not going to believe it until I see it. Seeing is believing. Now, when you move into a new kingdom, when your citizenship is transferred, you have to learn the new law that governs that kingdom. Because each nation has different laws. And if you visit a foreign nation, or if you go to live in a foreign nation, you better know the law of that nation, or at least be fully aware of it, so that you're not violating something you're ignorant of, because laws are different. We have laws in America that are very unique to America. I read about one this week, very unique law. Very strange law. Do you know in America today, it is illegal. It is against the law to ship, mail, transfer a pregnant lobster. <laughs> Completely against the law. That is against the law to ship a pregnant lobster because you may hurt the little lobster fetuses, the little lobster babies. So in America, according to our law, we are pro-life when it comes to lobsters. It's a pro-life nation. 
But you go to other nations in the world, and the laws are very different. If you go to Singapore, I love Singapore. It's one of my favorite nations. It's beautiful in Singapore. Incredible. Their laws are very different in Singapore than our laws. They're, they're a bit harsher than we are here in America. In fact, when you travel to Singapore, one of the things they tell you when you're buying the ticket is that if you bring drugs into the country, like if you are a drug trafficker, if you are caught with drugs, you bring drugs into the country, they will execute you. They don't care if you're American. They don't care how you feel about it. They don't care about your democratic rights. You're in their nation now. And their laws are different. And you need to be aware of their laws. Now, you may think, like, well, that, that's, that's horrible. They don't have crime problems like we have. Like, you go to Singapore, you can let your wife walk down the street at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you don't have to worry about her being assaulted. Because if you assault a woman in Singapore, you're executed within three days. They don't play around. But you need to be aware of their laws. There have been plenty of Americans that have gone to Singapore unaware of laws put some gum on a sidewalk, and all of a sudden found themselves being caned. And they didn't care that you were an American because you weren't in the kingdom of America. You were in the kingdom of Singapore, and you need to understand the law of the land you're living under. We are in the kingdom of God's Son now. We were transferred under the kingdom of light. And if you don't understand the law of the kingdom you're living in as a Christian, you will be frustrated because in our kingdom, we do not walk by faith. We walk, we, we, we walk by faith, not by sight. Meaning it's, it's possible to walk by sight. Christians do it all the time. Typically, when you begin to struggle in your faith, it's, it's you've fallen into walking by sight, not walking by faith. Almost every issue we counsel people in Christianity is someone that has fallen out of walking by faith and falling into walking by sight. Because we, we lived under that law for so long. It was who we were. It's what we knew. Now we've got to relearn a new law, and it takes time. You're not going to get there overnight, but we've got to begin. That's why Paul says in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't, don't conform to living by sight just because everyone else does it. Just because everyone else lives by the mantra, believing and seeing, don't conform to that. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to think differently. You've got to learn to walk by faith and not by sight because the wisdom of God is very different than the wisdom of the world. Sometimes they're similar, but oftentimes they're contradictory. Like the wisdom of God, the Bible says, give away, be generous, and you'll have more. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, think about it. If I have $100 and I give $10 away, I'm not going to have more, I'm going to have less. I mean, that's just math, right? But in the kingdom of God, if I give $10 away, I don't have less, I have more. And it's every time because there's a supernatural element to the life we live. So we have to understand the laws of the kingdom we live under so that we, we can operate in fullness in the kingdom that God has given us. So faith is our victory, number one. Faith is, this is faith, the victory that overcomes the world. The second thing I want you to understand about the kingdom we live in is number two, faith is a law. Faith is a law. It is the primary law of the kingdom that we live in. We live under faith, under the law of faith, the Bible says. Romans 3, 27, where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No, by the law of faith. Faith is a law. It is a law, the law of faith. I do not build my life on theories. I do not trust in theories. I trust in laws. Faith is a law. Let me put it like this. I do not board an airplane because of the theory of lift. I board an airplane because of the law of lift. I, I trust that it's a law and a law that works, like the law of motion, the law of gravity. What makes a law a law is it works for everybody all the time. Think about it. You board that airplane. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter if you're educated or uneducated, how much money you make doesn't matter where you're from or where you live. The law of lift will work for every single person on that plane because it is a law and it, is, it works equally for all. The law of gravity doesn't care if you're rich or poor, doesn't care if you're black or white, doesn't care what country you were born in or where you live currently. The law of lift doesn't care or the law of gravity doesn't care if you live in 2024 or 1024 or 624. It doesn't matter. 
It's a law because it works for everybody all the time. Faith is a law. Faith is a law. Just like the law of gravity, like the law of thermodynamics, like the law of lift, it is a law that we live by. You don't have to understand gravity for gravity to work in your life, by the way. You don't have to have a feeling about gravity for gravity to work in your life. Gravity works whether you like it or not. Faith is a law that works for everyone. And so when we learn how to live under that law, just like we learn to live under gravity, we have a good life. If I, if I violate gravity because I don't like it, I, I don't like the law of gravity, and so I'm just not, not going to abide by the law of gravity, splat, I get hurt, right? Faith is the same way. There is a law of faith that when we learn to live under that law, this is what overcomes the world. You have things in your life you need to overcome. To overcome those things, you have to learn how to live under the law of faith. So let's look at that. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, right now, this time, the time we're living in today. Now, faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope and faith are not the same. We don't live by the law of hope. We live by the law of faith. There are things I'm hoping for that I can't see right now, but I don't live by the law of sight. I live by the law of faith. So faith is the substance that what I cannot see, the thing that I'm hoping for that hasn't shown up yet is actually real. And this is what it means by we do not walk by sight. We walk by faith. Faith is the evidence of things that are not seen. You're going to see this pattern. Drop down to verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, can I be honest for a moment? I, what just happened in the room, I saw it in some of your faces, is your religious PTSD just, just, just bam, went through the roof right there. Because you saw that word, please God, and, and you've been taught your whole life, you need to please God. You need, and, and now you're starting to feel like, well, I'm not pleasing God. I don't read my Bible enough. I don't pray enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not working hard enough. How can I please God? God's not pleased with me. No, 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 no. Don't go there. This is not about the law and grace. That's not what we're talking about. You are under grace. I mean, think about this for a moment. How much is enough reading the Bible? Like, how, how much do you need to read the Bible every day for God to be pleased with you? Is it like a chapter, five minutes, 10 minutes, is an hour? Like, what if you read the Bible 19 hours a day, every day for the rest of your life? Would God be pleased with you? That's not what it's talking about. Don't go there. This is not at all about pleasing God because God's not happy with you or God doesn't like you or you've got to earn God's love. No, no, we, this is all under grace. And I'm going to show you that this entire series, this is all about grace. So it's not pleasing God in the sense of you've got to do things to get God to like you. What this pleasing is, is like a parent. Well, one of the most pleasing things in my life as a parent is on Christmas day. And I see my boys open presents that I bought them. And I see the joy and excitement on their face, and I see the gratitude on their heart. Can I tell you, that brings me pleasure as a father, to see them receive something I gave them out of love. It brings me pleasure. That's what this pleasure is. This pleasure is God seeing you receive something that God wants to bless you with. It brings him pleasure when you receive, and that's what faith is all about. So we're not trying to make God happy. God is already happy. We're not trying to please God because he's upset. No, he's, he's already pleased with you. But what brings him pleasure is when you learn to receive everything he has for you. So look at the rest of the verse. Because anyone who comes to him must believe, not do, not do, not, not anyone who comes to him must read their Bible more, pray more, do more religious activities, be a better Christian. No, no, it's believe. Believe that he exists and that he rewards. God is a rewarder. God is a rewarder. And I've got to accept by faith that God wants to reward me because of my believing, not my doing. He wants to reward my believing, my, my trusting in him, my believing what his son did for me at the cross. God is, you know what's sad to me? Most Christians today have more faith that God is a punisher than God is a rewarder. More Christians today have this idea that God wants to catch them doing something wrong, that God's never happy with them, and they've got to please God and work hard for God, that they got more faith in God being a punisher, and he's not a punisher. 
Jesus took all the punishment of God on the cross. There is nothing left over for you. The only thing God wants to do is reward you for believing. Reward you for believing that you are forgiven, that you are loved, that you are worthy, that you are righteous, that you are under grace. He wants to reward your believing. I mean, think about his love for a moment. I've got to learn as a believer to accept God's love. How do I do that? It's impossible. God's love is immeasurably. God's love is unconditional. All the love, by and large, that I've experienced in my life is conditional love. Maybe I've gotten a little bit of unconditional love from a parent. Maybe, maybe a little bit more from a grandparent. But almost every other relationship in our life, including marriage at times, is very conditional. And so how am I supposed to trust in this immeasurable, unconditional love that God has for me when I can't quantify it, I can't understand it, it's incomprehensible to me, I've never experienced anything like it? How do I accept God's love? Faith. There's no other way to accept it but by faith, just to believe that this is how God feels about me. So again, let's go back to the question, what is faith? How do I know that I'm walking by faith? How do I know that I'm living by faith? Well, first understand, faith is not a feeling. It'll affect your feelings, but faith is not a feeling. Faith is not an emotion. It'll affect your emotions, but it's not an emotion. Faith is not an attitude, but it will give you an attitude. You will get a faith attitude. Now, look, that's all good, but again, practically, pastor, what is faith? How do I know I'm walking by faith? Well, I'm glad you asked me that today, because I'm going to give you the answer. How many of you want to know? How many of you really want to know what faith is? How many of you really want to know whether or not you're walking in faith? I don't think you do. You're not, that, you're, you're not really that excited. Maybe I'll wait for you to come back next week and I'll give you the answer. How many of you want to know what faith is? Okay. So faith is our victory, yes. Faith is a law, yes. But number three, how do you know you're walking in faith? Faith is believing and speaking. Believing and speaking. Faith is believing and speaking. Faith is. Let me say it one more time. Believing and speaking. What is faith? Believing and speaking. 2 Corinthians 4.13. Look at this with me. It is written. This is Psalms 116. This is God speaking. God is speaking right now. I believed. I believed. Therefore, I've spoken. I believed. Therefore, I've spoken. Since we, you and I, those of us that are here today, that is we, that is us, have that same spirit of faith, the very same spirit of faith, the same spirit of faith, the same spirit that led God to say, therefore I believe, so I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. We have the same spirit of faith that God operates in. God believed, then he spoke. We have that same spirit, therefore we believe, and therefore we speak. Faith is believing and speaking. I believe, therefore I spoke. Now, let me ask the question. How many of you need me to teach you what speaking is? Anyone confused about what speaking is? We got that concept down, speaking, right? It's not thinking, Speaking is speaking. It's not thinking. Speaking is speaking. Like, I don't need to teach you what speaking means. What is believing? If faith is believing and speaking, and I know what speaking is, what is believing? Believing is simple. It's a choice. It's all it is. It's a choice. You choose to believe when you board that airplane and the pilot comes on and says, our destination is Phoenix. You can't see anything. You don't know where you're going. You chimp. You simply make a choice to believe that pilot is going to get you to Phoenix and not Dallas and not Denver and not anywhere else. You just believe. Faith is believing. It's believing. It's, it's, it's believing and speaking. And we make a choice to believe. We believe our parents. Make choice to believe them on whatever they say. You make choices every day at work to believe someone and what they say to you. You make choices when you go to the drive-thru and you order a hamburger and you can't see the hamburger. You, you, you just, you got this faith to believe that if I pull up to the window, there will be a hamburger. 
You're, like, you're believing that, that what they say is true. Like You can't see it. You can't see what they're doing in that kitchen. You're just trusting a voice. You're just believing what this voice says and hoping that when you pull up, it's going to be there. Believing is a choice. We choose to believe what God says about us in His Word. We choose to believe what God says about us in His Word. One of the things I love that my wife did Friday night is she handed out the 40 I Am's, which we provided you today. The 40 I Am's. These are 40 verses in the Bible of things God says about you. These are true about you. This is what God says about you. You make a choice to believe this is true. You make a choice to believe this is true. Now, here's where faith comes in. Not only do I believe, I make a choice to believe. And it's not a feeling, by the way, because I know some of you, when you read some of these things, you don't feel that way. You don't feel that way at all. In fact, you actually feel the opposite, but it's never been based on your feelings. It's been based on a choice. I make a choice to believe this, whether I feel like it or not. I make a choice to believe it, and then I speak it. I make a choice to believe it, then I speak it. I make a choice to believe I am a child of the living God. I am redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I am forgiven. I am saved by grace through faith. I am justified. I am sanctified. I make a choice, whether I feel like it or not, to believe this, and then I speak it out. What would your life look like if you just picked a couple of those every day? And you just began to believe and speak them. Believe and speak them. This... This is the victory that overcomes the world, our believing and our speaking. What if you made a choice to believe these things and spoke them every day? This is the victory that overcomes the world, our believing, and therefore we speak. In fact, what's going to happen this week in your small group is you're going to have a discussion in your small group about Jesus teaching faith in Mark 11, and you're going to see that this is exactly what Jesus teaches us. You go to Mark 11, it's exactly what Jesus teaches us, believing and speaking. Now, let me clear something up. You cannot believe without speaking. That doesn't work. That's where many Christians today fail to activate their faith. Many Christians today believe in their heart, but they never say anything. They never speak. They believe, but they don't speak. Faith is not believing. Faith is believing and speaking. God didn't think the world into existence. He spoke the world into existence. Let there be. See, here's what happens with a lot of believers. It's like you've got the most powerful rifle in the world, and you've got it fully loaded with ammunition. Like, it's powerful. It has potential. You believe in the power and the potential of this rifle, but if you don't pull the trigger, nothing happens. You have all the power, but if you don't pull the trigger, nothing happens. See, we believe in the power of God. We believe in God, but we don't pull the trigger. It's the speaking that pulls the trigger. Now, on the other side, you have people that have abused this teaching, and they speak without believing. The believing has to be aligned with God's word. They speak without believing. Let there be a red Corvette in my driveway. Let there be a red Corvette in my driveway. That's incantation. That's witchcraft. So there's got to be believing rooted in our speaking. I'm telling you, this is how you walk by faith. One of the things I like to do every morning is I have scriptures. This is, this is I brought this from my office today. Th- these are scriptures that every morning, because I don't know if you know this or not, the Bible was written to me. I don't know about you, but the Bible was written to me. It's personal. Every word in the Bible was written to me. It's personal. It's to me. It's It's personal. It was also written to you. And so what I've done is I've taken scriptures and I've personalized them. And I make a choice every morning to believe these and then speak them. As for me and the Jane family, we will serve the Lord. Aaron, what you heard from me, keep is a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. The one who is in me is greater than the one who is in the world. And all these things, I, Aaron, Jane, am more than a conqueror. Because this was written to me. It was written to me. And so every day I exercise faith by believing and speaking. God wants to speak to you. He just needs to borrow your tongue. And when your ears hear God's word, faith rises. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is why Hebrews 10, 23, I love this. It says, let us hold fast. Let us hold on 
Let us, let us not stop doing it, not get bored with it, not, not look at this as, as something that, that is in, in, you know, insignificant. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith. We need to profess our faith. We need to believe and speak without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Hold fast to your confidence. This is how we build faith. Do you realize you have the same amount of faith as every other Christian? You have the same amount of faith. Romans 12, 3. God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Every one of us have been given the same measure of faith. Every one of us have the same measure of faith. Now, you, you may think, no, 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 that person has, has way more faith than I do. No, they don't. They don't have more faith. They have bigger faith. There's a difference. You don't have more muscles in your body than I do. We have the same amount of muscles. We, we've been given a measure of muscles, you and I. Some of you have just treated them differently, and you look a lot better than me. You don't have more muscle than me. You have bigger muscle than me because you learn how to work it out. See, somebody doesn't have more faith than someone else. They just learn to exercise the faith. They learn to walk in the faith. They learn to build their faith. They have the same amount of faith. They just learn to build it. How do you build it? Believing and speaking. So I want you to watch this. You look at some of the great verses of faith in the New Testament. Look what happens when you understand what faith is. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by believing and speaking. We've been justified by believing and speaking. We've been saved, justified, made right with God by believing and speaking. Isn't that what Romans 10, Romans 10 says? We believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and we confess with our mouth we will be saved. We're justified by our believing and our speaking. Romans 1.17, the righteous shall live by believing and speaking. The righteous shall live by believing and speaking. Believing what? Believing I'm righteous. Believing I'm forgiven. Believing I'm loved. Believing I'm under grace. Believing I'm worthy. Believing I'm acceptable. Whether I feel like it or not, take emotions out of it. Faith is a choice to believe and speak the truth of God over your life. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now believing and speaking is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's why the fight of faith is not the fight to get anything, it's the fight to hold on. Because you can't see it yet, you're holding on, Paul says. The fight of faith, you're holding on, you're, you're believing and speaking even when you can't see it. Hebrews 11.6, without believing and speaking, it's impossible to please God. God wants you to believe that he loves you. He wants you to believe you're forgiven. He wants you to believe that you're righteous and worthy and acceptable, and he wants you to declare it. And that brings him pleasure when you see yourself the way he sees you. Ephesians 6, 16. Take up the shield of believing and speaking with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did when he fought the devil? The devil was throwing these fiery arrows at Jesus. Eat this bread, jump off the building. I'll give you all the money in the world. Those are the fiery darts of the devil. Those are the temptations of the devil coming at Jesus. And he holds up the shield of what? Faith, believing and speaking. Believing the truth of God's word. And then what did he do? Spoke it. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And it was the shield of believing and speaking that quenched the fiery darts of the devil that day. Let's go back to where we began. First John 5, 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this, this right here is the victory that has overcome the world. Our believing and speaking, our believing and speaking is the victory that overcomes the world. Not our worship. Worship is important, but it's not worship that is the victory that overcomes the world. It's our believing and speaking. Now, worship is a form of believing and speaking because we are singing songs, which is speaking. We're singing them out loud. And if we believe the words we're singing out loud, then it is a form of faith. But it's the believing and speaking that overcomes 
the world. So let me ask you the question. What are you believing and speaking right now? Well, every, everybody in my family ends in divorce. Uh, we're just hot-headed people. We just, you know, we got a short fuse. We got a temper. We got, we got red hair. What do you believe in the speaking? Well, all the, all the women in my family line end up with breast cancer. That's just, it's just part of our family line. You know, everybody in my family dies early. Like, what are you believing in speaking? You're believing in speaking something. You're choosing to believe something, and you're choosing to speak something every day. What are you believing in speaking over your marriage? What are you believing in speaking over your children? I'm not talking about living in delusion or denial. The truth is, if I walk by sight, there could be sickness in my body. Faith says I'm healed. Reality says there's sickness. So what do I do? I believe and speak. Doesn't mean I don't go to doctors. God may heal me through medicine. God may heal me through surgery. God may heal me supernaturally. It doesn't matter to me. My job is to walk by faith and not by sight. To believe and speak the truth that I'm healed. I'm forgiven. I'm loved. To walk by faith and not by sight. So what are you believing and speaking over your life right now, over your children right now? What are you believing and speaking over your marriage, over your finances, over your health? What are you believing and speaking? Let, let me end with this illustration to really help you understand practically how this works. Go back to the law of lift for a moment. When a pilot gets in an airplane, this massive piece of metal that should not be able to fly because it's too heavy, because the law of lift can appear to contradict the law of gravity. So the pilot gets in the plane and he gets on the runway and he begins to take off. What does he do? He believes that the law of lift will work. He doesn't hope it'll work. He believes it'll work. You understand the difference? He doesn't hope that it works. If he hoped that it works, he wouldn't be on the runway. He'd be in a classroom somewhere trying to figure it out. When he's in the cockpit, and he hits that throttle, he is believing in the law of lift. Now, what's happening with his sight at that moment is this runway is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And there's trees at the end of the runway. And it would be very easy to doubt. Like, I wonder if it's going to work this time. I wonder if it's going to work this time. I wonder if it's going to work this time. Where is the speaking? The speaking is him holding down the throttle. He holds down the throttle, even though what he sees is imminent doom. What he sees in front of him is we are flying down this runway hundreds of miles per hour, heading right into a forest of trees. That's what he sees. But he makes a choice to believe in the law of lift. And the speaking part is he holds down the throttle. And just in time, the law of lift works and pulls him above the trees. Now, what would happen if he operated like many Christians in the law of faith? Paul says, don't go weary while doing what is right, for in due season you'll reap. Well, too many of us grow weary. What, what, if, what, if, what if he starts doubting in the law of lift? And he gets scared and he pulls back on the throttle the wrong direction because he doesn't see it working. His eyes are saying, this isn't working, this isn't working, this isn't working. We've been running down this freeway and it's getting shorter and there's all these trees. It's not working, it's not working, it's not working. And he What's going to happen is they're going to crash. They're never going to get off the ground. People may die. They're not going to get to their destination. He's got to believe in the law of lift, and he's got to hold that throttle down. And he's got to walk by faith and not by sight, because his sight is deceiving him in that moment. And he's got to trust that the law of lift is going to take. The law of lift is going to work. Even though I, I can't see it, I've got to walk by faith and not by sight. And that's what that pilot does. And this is how we operate in our faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. I believe and I speak no matter what I see. I believe and I speak. Even though everything around me may, may look scary and it may look doomed and it may look nothing's happening. I believe and I speak. And that's what it means to practically walk by faith. And this is the victory that will allow you to overcome 
the world. Now, you may think, man, this sounds like the exact opposite of what we just got done looking at in the book of Job. Like how to handle suffering and how to handle... No, if you really go back to the book of Job and reread it, this is what Job does. This is what allowed Job to overcome all of the suffering of the book of Job. He believed God. Even though he was emotional, he believed God and he spoke truth. At the end, he spoke truth. And it was believing and speaking that allowed him to get through all the adversity of the book of Job. This is critical. There's going to come a time in your life where you're going to need to know this. You're going to be put in a situation with somebody you love, somebody you care about, a challenge in life, and you're going to need to know how to walk by faith and not by sight because everything in front of you says you're about to crash. It's scary. It's terrifying. And you're going to have to walk by faith and not by sight. Would you close your eyes with me for a moment?